survivors how you guys doing this morning or this evening whenever you're listening to this show this podcast if you're maybe watching welcome i'm the avatar of beto gudino the real beto gudino is in bed because he has the stomach flu but i'm the avatar lost in the multiverse pondering this question does god exist how have humans responded to this question throughout the ages well what are the best arguments for and against the idea of a supreme being and finally if there is a god is jesus god well today we have an expert who wrote a book precisely about all these topics it's called does god exist a history of answers to the question his name is david beck and he's emeritus professor of philosophy at liberty university and i'm holding his book in my hands and he's holding his book in his hands too <laughs> David, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Good morning. Good to be with you. Awesome. Can you show us the book again? I saw you had it in your hands. <laughs> There, There it is. is. Okay, so we have the same book in our hands. So cool. <laughs> David, um, welcome. So glad you, you, um, you're here on the show. And... Well, first of all, would you tell us a little bit about yourself, the kind of work that you do at Liberty University and who you are? Okay. Well, I'm this year I've retired, uh, but I've been teaching here at Liberty for 43 years, teaching philosophy. I actually started the department uh, 43 years ago, um, wow. and we've had a great time. Um, So I, I teach philosophy, uh, still teach philosophy online and occasionally teach courses on campus. Uh, but I've been teaching this particular course on the existence of God for at least 40 years now. Um, and it's about time I finally got around to writing the book. I've let other people write all kinds of books. Uh, but actually, it's been a while since there is a good anthology available. Um, and so that's what I originally wanted to write, um, was simply to put together an anthology of important pro and con uh, on the existence of God. But uh, it turned out uh, to be a quite different book. It is an anthology that covers the whole history, um, not just within Christian contexts, but uh, globally. And um, But then I give it a lot of narrative along the way, a lot of my own commentary and discussion. Uh, so the book is actually about half and half. That's why it got to be 300 pages uh, instead of 150. So. Yes, yes, there's a lot of pages in the book for sure. And I highly recommend that if you're like a lover of philosophy, even, you know, of uh, theology and things like that, highly recommend it. And uh, David, my experience with philosophy is this much. Probably <laughs> René Descartes, that, that, that's how we say in Spanish. I think it has a different uh, pronunciation in English. Uh, Descartes, maybe uh, they call him. But René Descartes, who said, I think, therefore, I exist, right? He said something like that. Pienso, luego existo, yeah. right? That, I mean, that's as far as I get with philosophy. No, I'm a communications <laughs> guy, but I love, I love the topic of you know, how people have think and thought about God. And did you say um, that people formally started thinking about the idea of God in like 600 BC? Is that what you said in the book? Well, that's the first time, at least in recorded history, that we start seeing people thinking through formal arguments for God's existence. 
But actually, as far back as we really can tell, uh, people have always been worshiping God. Um, we can't tell exactly uh, what they thought and how they thought about God, but um, as far back as we have uh, constructed buildings well back into the Stone Age, 10, 12,000 BC, um, it's already clear that life revolves around some sort of worship of God. There are temples. Uh, the earliest ones look a lot like Stonehenge. Um, and so uh, what we see there is uh, that people are already worshiping uh, some sort of creator uh, who is in charge of the universe. Uh, these uh, worship centers typically are organized around the sun, um, which maybe we can understand in terms of some sort of creator. Um, and what's also interesting is that these worship centers are also burial centers. So uh, they are closely related to life and death and um, how human beings have focused their lives. Uh, and in this sense, it's clear that human beings are very unique. Um, they aren't anything at all like what are supposed to be our nearest ancestors other primates. Uh, other primates show no behaviors at all that reflect this kind of thinking. Um, and as far back as we know, human beings have been thinking about God and worshiping some sort of God who they understand to be the creator or, and source of everything that is. Mm. Love it. And I, I guess, David, one of my... my question when when it comes to this idea of does God exist and how humans have thought about God throughout the ages is I mean it's I was even like doing if I say research uh, please bear with me because it means I went on Google and and asked the question okay <laughs> <laughs> but I was doing some well, that's how most people do it these days <laughs> right so I was doing research on Google and I put how many people um, in the world believing God and to my surprise it seems like there's there's more people who believe in God than people who don't right than atheists uh, so that brought me to, like does it make sense to be an atheist what are some of the arguments that you have encountered through history that kind of point to like well it could make sense if you take it from this angle that you know just to give the benefit of the doubt right or to play devil's advocate uh, it makes sense to be an atheist in this way. What have you encountered, David? Well, uh, actually, the real idea of atheism is a very modern idea. We, we really don't get uh, atheists who, in a sort of formal way, um, disbelieve in the reality of God until we get into the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, this phenomena starts to appear. Um, yeah, it's getting a bit more popular these days, but you know, it's still the case that well upwards of 90% of Americans uh, believe that there is a God of some sort. Um, and globally, the numbers are about the same. Uh, there are some parts, especially of Europe, uh, where atheism uh, is at least a little more common, or maybe we should say agnosticism. Um, but by and large, you're right. The vast majority of people around the world still believe that there is a God of some sort. Um, we disagree, of course, on all sorts of things, but I'm not really concerned about that in the book. The book is simply a question, does God exist? And most people pretty much agree about that. Now, um, I would say overall, um, the biggest objection uh, that comes to um, 
the arguments for God's existence is what we call the problem of evil. Uh, and certainly on, on an individual basis, even among Christians, uh, the most common reason why people leave their faith, I've encountered this um, with friends and neighbors, uh, is simply that there is too much evil, that there is some powerful tragedy in a person's life, and they simply cannot believe uh, that there is a God. Um, so I would say that is sort of globally um, the strongest argument. But if you think about it, um, it isn't really an argument at all against the existence of God. Um, it can be a powerful argument against the kind of God uh, that Christians believe in, and certainly it can disrupt uh, our personal relationship. I, I, I suspect that all Christians at some point have had doubts, um, have had problems relating to uh, this personal God because of some sort of tragedy or evil or pain or suffering, something of that sort that they have encountered. But I, I'll try it this way. Um, it's most often used against the argument for design that um, the argument itself is simply that there is so much order and design and structure and even beauty, et cetera, in the world uh, that there has to be some sort of mind, some sort of designer, some sort of organizer, et cetera, um, behind it. Um, so now the objection is, yeah, but there's a lot of evil in the universe too. Uh, and, and I think you do, of course, have to deal with that issue, uh, and we do in the book, uh, but the most obvious response to that is, you know, it's really quite irrelevant. If there is sufficient order and design to demand a designer, then there is. It, it really doesn't matter what else there is. If, if I go to a um, car dealer and look at the new 2022s that are beginning to appear, uh, I'm amazed at all of the order and design, all the new computer contraptions that they put on cars. I mean, now almost every car is pretty well equipped to drive itself. Uh, all these incredible things that are on the car. I, I can't look away from that and say, well, it's pretty amazing what chance will do when you put a bunch of parts uh, in a car parts factory and, and, and just blow it up. It's amazing what chance will do. No, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so clearly there has to be some sort of designer behind us. Well, now suppose it turns out there's only one of them. Uh, a lot of car lots these days are only a, one or two cars. They can't get any new ones. Um, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't really mean anything. It would only take one to do this. And let's suppose that after a year, it turns out this car has all sorts of problems with it and people have been killed in accidents because of various recalls that have had to be made, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, again, granted, that will say something to me about the designer and the overall competence of the designer, but it doesn't eliminate the designer. It's still a simple case. If there's enough evidence for a designer, then there is. Mm -hmm. Wow. And is, is that just, uh, I mean, I, I'm trying to go back to my, my high school days in <laughs> logic and philosophy and I mean, first of all, it's so interesting to me how mathematics, it's so intertwined with the thought about God, right? And even like all these philosophers throughout the ages, you read that you know, many of them were not only uh, philosophers, but they were mathematicians, right? Yes. They were people who were in the, in the 
exact science of mathematics. And I mean, to me, that's just super interesting that it seems like um, as they're trying to figure out, like mathematics, it's, it's like two and two is four, right? Two plus two is four, like it's exact. And as they're trying to um, understand mathematics, and this is, I mean, this is humanity understanding themselves and, and knowledge. And in a sense, the more they discover that, the more they discover, wow, does it seem like there is a designer, a creator behind this? Um, tell me a little bit about that relationship between the thinkers and mathematics. Like, like, do you see that that intertwined too, as you studied some of these? Oh, yeah. Right. What is that relationship right there? What do you? Well, where do you think that comes from? Uh, given the American educational system. <laughs> where we don't actually come across philosophy except for an intro course somewhere along the line in college. Um, it's almost never the case that uh, people in philosophy get started in philosophy. Um, almost all of my friends in philosophy began with mathematics or especially one of the sciences, and you're right. It's precisely because uh, they were so amazed by the structure and organization uh, that they found in these fields that they were pushed to ask deeper questions. Um, yeah, how, how is it that the universe is so carefully mathematically organized uh, all the way through? <laughs> Nobody doubts that when we land on Mars, we will find that the same mathematics still works there. Mm. Nobody has ever questioned that. I have never heard a scientist say, wow, we, we got to be really careful when we land on Mars because who knows what the mathematics is like on Mars. It could be entirely different. No, mm. the, the mm. mathematics is part of the sort of base built-in logic of the universe. And uh, that has to be explained. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so good. I love that. Well, thank you for elaborating on that. And uh, so we talked about some of the typical arguments against the idea of God. And as I was also thinking of, you no know, back to my high school days of René Descartes and I think, therefore, I exist or therefore I am. And I, I mean, I was reading in your book about this idea of, uh, and even with this mathematical equations of the universe and you know, how the universe came to be and all the details behind it that seem to point to a, a structure that seems like there is a there is a supreme being behind it, right? Or a designer behind it. Design. So I was thinking, it's, there's this idea of cause and effect. Like everything that happens is because there's, there's a cause that produces an effect. But is God the ultimate on cause? Like who, who caused God? Like even, I mean, if I take it to my kid's question, it, it would be like, who created God, right? <laughs> uh, is, I mean... Um, is there any answer to that when we think of, does God exist? Like, who created God? I mean, if we try to respond to my 10-year-old, my 8-year-old, with when they come up with that type of question, what can we answer? And then what is maybe the more elaborate answer to a, an older person like me? Okay. Um, yeah, what you're talking about is what we call the cosmological argument, and that's the first one I deal with in the book. Um, I like to use the example of trains. A actually, people have been using train examples for this argument uh, as far back as there were trains. Um, back in the medieval period, they used oxen and cart examples. Um, so it's simply this. Suppose you come to a train crossing, uh, typical out in the Midwest, uh, and all you can see are boxcars. It's just forever boxcars all the way down the line. Um, but the boxcars are moving. So what do you know? 
Well, ask yourself, all right, here's one coming along. Um, what's pulling it? How comes this boxcar is moving? It doesn't have a motor, so how is this boxcar moving? Well, it's being pulled by the one in front of it, obviously. Okay, and, it's, and that one is being pulled by the one in front of it, and that one's being pulled by the one in front of it, et cetera, et cetera, as far as I can see down the line. And suppose I were to say, uh, well, I guess there are just a lot of boxcars. Well, that won't work. Right? It doesn't matter how many boxcars there are. It doesn't matter how many boxcars there are in front of this one that's moving. I still haven't explained how this one is moving no matter how many boss cars there are. So what I have to conclude is, even though I can't see it, even though maybe I've never seen one, what I have to conclude is that there is something in front of these box cars that has the capacity to move by itself and also to pull the other box cars. Well, that's the point here. When I look at the world around me, you're right. What I see are things being caused by other things. Nothing just sort of happens by itself. So I have to ask the question, well, all right, how far back does this go? Well, notice, I don't need to answer that. It doesn't matter how many links there are in this causal chain. It doesn't matter how many boxcars there are on the chain. What I know is this, that somewhere along the line, there is something that exists all by itself. It doesn't need anything else to exist. And it has the capacity to make everything else exist. There's your basic definition of God. So now if you ask the question, yeah, but what caused it? The only way I can respond is to say, you didn't understand the argument. Mm. The argument is simply that somewhere along the line, there has to be a locomotive. There has to be something capable of pulling itself, of existing on its own, and of creating all of the other things that exist, of pulling all the other boxcars. So if you ask, yeah, but, but what's pulling the locomotive? You don't understand locomotives. Hmm. And if you understand, if you ask the question, sorry, what created God, the only thing I can say is you didn't understand the argument. The argument shows there has to be something that causes itself, hmm. that therefore is infinite. That's what we call God. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so God is... I mean, right now, I feel like, okay, God is the motor that makes the universe happen, right? Well, and, that's a good analogy, yeah. All right. So so what is, I mean, when, when I think of an atheist, like, who is the most popular atheist? And what is, like, their, what is, like, their first, like, their most typical argument about rejecting that idea? Like, I don't see that design. Like, how can they not see it? I mean, I know it's uh, you're you're talking about a, a a locomotive. I don't know if they'd be like, "Come on, man!" But what is yeah. there? Why do they not? Un what is their? Yeah, what is their typical argument against? I don't see a designer. I don't see a motor behind the universe. Like, who's the most popular guy that contradicts this idea right now? Well, uh, again, I think. Uh, I would say the most popular idea here um, is the notion that, um, well, people like Graham Opie and others will argue this point, that, um, that you can just go on to infinity, that there might just be infinite causes to the universe. Mm -hmm. But again, I... I that just seems to be obviously problematic to me. Uh, it, to say that there are just infinite boxcars doesn't help. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't answer the question. And we often get it, uh, I would say, among philosophers and especially philosophical scientists, uh, what we get most often these days is the idea that there is a multiverse. 
there isn't just one universe, there are many universes, maybe infinite universes. And again, it seems to me the response is, doesn't make any difference. So there are infinite trains with each of them in infinite boxcars. <laughs> you, you still haven't answered the question. In, in, in fact, the more boxcars you pile up, the more trains that you pile up, the more I need an answer. You, you, haven't, made, you haven't gotten us closer to an answer. You're, you're just pushing us further away from an answer. Mm. So multiverse doesn't matter here. Wow. <laughs> and I mean, I love that you're talking about multiverse because um, I think I'm getting closer to philosophy through the Marvel universe, right? Because they use the multiverse all the time in their movies. Yeah. And I was, I mean, this is going to sound strange, maybe weird, but I want to compare this idea of the multiverse and what's his name? the guy that travels through time, Doctor Strange, right? So yes. in this movie, uh, I think it's called The End Game. It's, no, it's probably like four years ago. Uh, but anyways, it's this idea of the multiverse and Doctor Strange is holding this this little gem in his hand and it's the, the time stone. And he's looking, he's going in time and he's looking at all the, posi all the possible outcomes in which they triumph over evil, right? So, I mean, it's interesting because when I think of these guys, I'm like, wow, there's there's something biblical in that. I don't know how to say it, but um, let's look at it from this angle. He says, uh, in all the possible outcomes, he looks through, no, whatever he goes and looks through the times and says, there's like 14 billion possibilities. <laughs> and we only win in one of them, right? So the Avengers only win in one of the possibilities. And I was thinking, okay, let's say there is a multiverse when it comes to God and creation and, and no humans. And let's say Jesus is the one possible outcome, Right, I love how the Bible says in the in you knowing John, it says in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. Right, and then we know what Jesus did, and through Him, I feel like we we encountered this one possible outcome. And I think, what if everything we're living in this world, right? It's it's almost like I think some scholars and theologians have called it the waiting room so what if this world is really a waiting room to to the next reality and the way to come to this next reality is through jesus christ the one possible outcome who was from the beginning and what is the beginning like you said right i mean there's a locomotive and we'll just call it the beginning right. uh, and that's it but He's the Alpha and the Omega. Right. And to get to that one possible outcome is through him. And, I mean, uh, is that is that kind of like the, the idea of the, the multiverse? Is that it? That there could be many possible outcomes and many possible um, ends to, to one's story? Well... In a sense, yeah, but the, the, the multiverse is the idea that, in fact, all of these possible worlds are real worlds. Mm. Um, and again, we're still fussing about this idea. It's by no means proven to be true, but, but right now it's a pretty popular idea amongst physicists. Uh, Stephen Hawking uh, adopted this idea and made it quite popular. Um, but, but again, it, it, it doesn't change anything. Um, the, the point is that all of these possible universes, even if all of them are real, they are all organized by the same mathematics, by the same laws of physics. Now, the actual laws, say the law of gravity, the constants may vary from universe to universe, but in general, the basic mathematics and physics is the same everywhere. 
And so you still have to ask the question, how come? How could it be that all of this is so carefully organized, even if the possibles turn out all different in different universes? Mm -hmm. Wow. And I mean, I see now I see how we, we get to the question of the problem of evil. Yeah. Uh, because that that's really the only question there is here, right? Because I, I feel like uh, there is, I mean, to me, the argument for God is is way more clear, even though you like like we were saying, right? Which God? Well, maybe we can talk about that later, right? But but the the idea of there's got to be an intelligent uh, uh, mind or intelligent design behind all these things happening or a motor. Um, but the problem of evil, I get, I guess gets in the way because the main question that you were saying before is, okay, how can, how can a good God allow bad things? I mean, if there's a good creator who's capable of anything in the universe, well, why do we have poverty? Why do we have world hunger? Why do we have, right? Why do we die? Right? Things like that. Why do we suffer? Um, and I mean, ultimately I feel like, uh, In Jesus, I mean, he's super clear about, yeah, there will be suffering in this world, but there's a promise of something even better coming, right? Um, and I guess that comes with um, inviting people to trust and maybe to faith. And I can see how that might be even a different realm of believing and a different invitation than just believing in God. So maybe we can go from does God exist to who that God is and what that means in terms of like having a relationship with that God. Uh, but let's, let's just stay in the problem of evil for now. because um, I mean, I think this is probably the, like you were saying the best argument. And even with my friends who are um, non-believers, I would feel like that is what they see. You know, I was talking to one of my friends, he's from, he's Italian and he was saying, I don't, I don't think he's necessarily an unbeliever. I think he's more like agnostic, something like that, along those lines. But he was saying, I think the world is just going to, it's getting worse and worse, right? It's just becoming bad and bad and bad. And I was almost agreeing with him like, yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening, you know? Um, but, but this idea of the... The problem of evil, I feel like the problem with the problem of evil is that it doesn't come from the motor or the creator or the designer. It comes from the created. From It comes from us. So the problem of, to me, the causation, what I, what I understand it is the causation of evil is humans, right? It's, it's the fact that we are allowed to have choices And the choices we make will have consequences and consequences, you know, have consequences and consequences. So right. I, I think it's more it's more on us as humans when we think of the problem of evil than it is on God. Because ultimately, I feel like that is precisely the concept of freedom that we get to choose, that we are. If there is a creator, he didn't create robots. He didn't create people who just worship him out of uh, uh you know like this is it this is all i know and i just worship no it's a it's an intentional worship like nobody makes me worship jesus i worship jesus you're a pretty good philosopher right <laughs> okay so uh, is that am i on the right path then when i think of this problem of evil yeah i would i would say um Basically, there are two things that God doesn't violate. He is the creator of all things, and he can do all things, but he has organized the universe along two lines that he doesn't violate. The first is natural law. Mm. The laws of physics and mathematics are in place, And granted, there are times when God 
reaches in and does miracles in a sense, but, but even then he doesn't violate the laws of physics. He simply has the capacity to control the laws in ways that we don't. I mean, we have the capacity as well. When I do that, notice that I'm controlling one of the most essential laws of the universe, gravity. I'm preventing gravity from having its normal course. Now, my capacity to do that is pretty limited. If that book were about twice as heavy, uh, I would just fall. I wouldn't be able to hold it. God's capacity to control the laws is infinite, but he leaves the laws in place. And so you're right, things have consequences, and things have perfectly natural consequences. When a tree falls on someone, it kills them. That's one of the natural consequences. The other thing that God leaves intact is the one that you just talked about, free will. God has created human beings with free will, and he doesn't get in the way of that. And so we are perfectly capable of bringing about evil in each other's lives. And you're right, this has consequences, which have consequences, which have consequences. This has been going on now for how many thousands and thousands of years, and the consequences are stacking up. And perhaps you're right that things are overall getting worse because the consequences of our evil, it, it, it's just stacking up higher and higher. Uh, I don't know if things are really getting worse. Uh, seems to me some things are getting better, but obviously in the middle of a pandemic that we thought was gonna be over two years ago, things still keep getting worse. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but I would add one thing. Um, I also know of people who have come to belief in God, have become Christians as a result of evil and tragedy in their lives, especially philosophers. I know of three philosophers who have come to belief in God from out of their atheism precisely because of evil in their life. And here's the point. When evil really strikes you, you have to be able to define it. And you can't define evil without defining good. Evil is the absence of good. And we can't define good without there being some sort of ultimate definition of good, namely the reality of God. Mm. So there's, there's a subtle little pathway here from evil that in fact leads directly to God. If wow. there's disorder, that could only be because there is a larger order that's in place against which you can define the disorder. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, the, the I love that because evil, um, yeah, to define evil, you got to define good and I mean that's precisely I think one of what one of the reasons I mean I grew up I grew up in the in the Christian faith I'm just going to say kind of like that so people can understand my background um but at the same time I have always pondered questions right and I guess we all have a philosopher in us who's asking those type of questions does God exist you know is 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 there an ultimate good an ultimate bad and you no know, what is the ultimate reality whatever you no know, all these questions and I think what started making sense to me was one that I understood that e exactly that, that there is evil. And I think the more I understood that, wow, evil is real, it pointed me to goodness. It pointed me, there's, right. there's got to be a source of the good. Like, I, I can be good, but I'm not the main source of the goodness, right? So when I understood scripture and I understood who Jesus said he was and what he did and what he showed us. I'm like, he's showing us. I mean, he said it again and again. I, I come to inaugurate the kingdom of God. And yes, I mean, maybe that sounds religious, whatever people want to say, right? 
But to me, the kingdom of God is, he's saying, this is what goodness looks like. And it's all relationships. It's like he's showcasing what goodness can look like in relationship to another human. So he started showcasing, this is what kindness looks like. This is what real generosity looks like. This is... This is what uh, forgiveness looks like. And I mean, everything that's good, he showcased. And then he said something like, everything there is to know about the father. So everything there is to know about the motor, the creator, the, 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 the person that moves the universe, I have made, made known to you, right? So then, therefore, I thought, okay, If he's saying that he that everything there is to know about this creator has been made available to me, what is that? Right? And that's when I discover it's the goodness. It's the goodness of God. It's like everything is the source of all this good. So in this world, yeah, we'll have evil. And even I think that's part of the the we get to have a choice every day to like take up your cross daily and follow me, he said, right? It's almost like Every day you get to choose goodness over evil. Which one are you going to pick? And then there's the beauty of his mercies are new every day. So like every day you get to to say, can I? But but you got to know the source, right? So I guess what I'm saying is, how do we go from does God exist? How can we help people go from, yes, maybe there is a God to is Jesus God. Do you under I mean do you uh I I guess you're a believer, right? So would you say Jesus is God and how do you help people once they go from atheist to yes, maybe there is a God to can I introduce Jesus to you? Well, yeah, one of the ways to say what you were just saying uh that goes back to those early verses in John that that he is the word. John's word there for word is logos, that he is the logic of things. Uh, I have a t-shirt that I like to wear around Christmas. It has a manger scene on, I should be wearing it now, it has a manger scene on it, and below it says, true story. Uh. <laughs> and, and that's the point, that The Christian story, if you will, is the true one. It's the only one that really makes sense of everything, including evil. Mm. There are other religions that simply deny the reality of evil or who attribute it to God, that God, in fact, can contradict himself and do whatever he wants to do. Um, I don't think that makes sense. It seems to me that it's the Christian story that makes sense. And, and now we have to add, it's also the story that's true. So the next argument, I don't have to write this book because it's already been written. The, the next argument after the one I talk about in this book is, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Because if he did, then it follows from that that he is who he said he was, namely God himself. Because only God can overcome death. So now we have a different type of question. This is not a philosophical question. This is a straightforward historical question. Is there evidence to show that Jesus rose from the dead? To which the answer is yes. The evidence is overwhelmingly that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead. And now we're sort of done. Now it's clear that the Christian story, the Bible, if you will, is true. It is, in fact, the true story about things, about human beings, and who we are, and who God is, and how we come to relationship with God. Now we have the rest of the picture put together. So uh, I always tell my students, there are really only two things you need to know. You need to know that God exists, and the arguments are pretty clear. And you need to know that Jesus rose from the dead, and the evidence for it is overwhelming. 
we're done, right? Everything else falls in place once you have those two. Mm, that's so good. Right. Well, I'll be waiting for that book about the resurrection. <laughs> that's so good. Well, uh, that book that book has been written many, many times. Uh, look for anything by Gary Habermas or Mike Lacona there, or Lee Strobel. Um, there are awesome. lots of good examples of that book. Love it. Yeah, I'll, I'll look for it. And so, uh, David, I want to end by, by going to an emoji session right now. All right. So okay. first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rate your book with an emoji. Yes, that's what I said. I'm going to rate your book with an emoji reaction. This is my reaction to the book. Does God exist? A history of answers to the question. Holy emoji. Holy emoji. <laughs> David, how do you feel by getting the holy emoji reaction? <laughs> well, I'm grateful to you. Awesome. Well, now you're going to see on my screen. The, uh, there they are. There they are. Okay. So what we're going to do to end the episode, David, is you're going to tell me each with each one of these emojis, we're going to go from the worst, which is blasphemous, all the way to divine. So you're going to tell me out of all the ideas about the existence of God, what is the most blasphemous one? that you can think of right now? Uh, that God is the source of evil. That God is the source of evil. Okay, that's blasphemous right there. Um, yes. The next one, what is the most skeptical idea about the existence of God? Uh, that maybe this could have all happened by chance. Wow, that's so good. Awesome. Um, Let's move on to the inspired emoji. What is the most inspired idea about the existence of God? Oh, I suppose that um, that God must love us because he created things the way he did. Mm, so good. And the next one would be holy. What's a holy idea when it comes to the existence of God? Uh, that God must be infinite oh. to have created all of this. Love it. And finally, what is the most divine idea about the existence of God? Uh, that God is good. Oh, that's so good. That's so good, David. Well, David, thank you so much for being on the show. Can you uh, invite people maybe to follow you on where can people go to find out more about the work that you do? Do you have a website, a web page where you want to direct people to? No, I don't have a website. All right. You can go and get the go and get the book. All right. Then we'll have it at uh, christianpodcast.com. We'll have a link to the book. So go there. Check it out. David, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for giving us your time. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too, Beto. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now. Mire, crean, La esperanza del futuro.